All right, um, let's get started. I've got too many slides and not enough time. Story of my life, try to talk quick and leave some room for questions. But uh, thanks for joining. Um, as you can see, my talk is on boot to cloud security considerations with IoT. It's a bit of a big topic, so we're not gonna dive into super deep details. Uh, it's really more just to lay down some signposts if this is a problem space you're interested in, point you in the right direction, and try to give you some help to dig into some of the specific details just because there's too much to cover. Um, just to get started, um, about me, the least interesting slide in the presentation, but uh, my name is Kevin Townsend. I'm, I'm a tech lead at Lenaro. I've been there for about four, four and a half years now. My main focus is generally on ARM more on the MCU side, a little bit Cortex-A, Cortex-R, but mostly the Cortex-M side of things, uh, RTOSIS and IoT security. I've been working for about 15 years full time um, just in open source software. It's, it's always been my bread and butter. It's a conscious choice. I just love uh, being able to contribute to, to both the open source hardware and the open source community in general. Much more of a firmware person today than my earlier career was really more on the hardware side. Um, which, is, which is good in a sense, in the embedded space, you really need to ha have a little bit of a foot in both of those camps uh, sometimes. I'm the Zephyr maintainer for AARCH32, uh, the trusted firmware I'm integration, and just a small little hobby personal project, Zephyr Scientific Computing Library. I just really enjoy working with sensor data, and to me, embedded devices, it's all about taking data, doing fun things with it, and having interesting outcomes. So just a small library I put together to sort of do linear algebra and things like that. Uh, um, and if you're interested, uh, you can see some of, uh, some of my work on, on, on MicroBuilder and that's the, the GitHub username um, obviously for uh, Zephyr um, if, you, if you need to reach out to me for something. So in terms of agenda, again, these are, these are just sort of high level things, but we're gonna look a little bit at secure boot at device provisioning. Um, and specifically a bit of a sidetrack on, on key derivation, which is one of the more important parts, I think, of, of the provisioning process. Uh, how do you secure data in transit? How do you secure data at rest? And we'll distinguish the difference between the two of those. Uh, a quick example um, of tying these things together, what a end-to-end -end solution for boot to cloud security might look like, um, called Confidential AI, which is just an open source proof of concept we put together in, in, in my team in Lenaro. And then a quick checklist wrap up. So let's get started just in the interest of time. Uh, so generally, if, if you're thinking about a secure IoT system, it's probably gonna look at a very high level, something like this. You're gonna have a couple key components here. You're gonna have secure boot, which is generally referred to as your root of trust. You're gonna have some sort of firmware component and that firmware component may or may not be, uh, be separated into two different execution environments. Um, if you're using something like Trusted Firmware M, for example, you're gonna end up with two firmware images where you'll have a secure uh, or a trusted processing environment and an untrusted processing environment. Um, and your, your, your sort of firmware decision-making choices, whether you have a single monolithic firmware image or a secure non-secure image is, is gonna be based on a variety of factors that only you know. So you'll have that, that secure root of trust, your firmware image, then on the far right side, you're gonna have to have some sort of provisioning um, infrastructure for your solution and generally some sort of cloud connectivity that doesn't necessarily have to be AWS, Amazon, Google, whoever. Uh, maybe that's behind a company fire firewall, but generally you're gonna wanna get that data off that device somehow for analysis and potentially get information from the cloud infrastructure onto your devices for more updates, sending commands, et cetera. So generally these at a very high level, th these are kind of the key um, silos that you're gonna need to look into on a secure IoT system. So let, let's start with secure boot at, at sort of the front end of that pipeline. And that's a really important one because secure boot is the one thing that you absolutely want to get right and you don't want that to be an afterthought. If you do not have a secure trusted boot process, you don't have a secure anything because you don't know what you're running. You have no way to verify that this is a trusted image that it hasn't been tampered with, et cetera. So you do not wanna leave this um, to be an afterthought. You absolutely want from the very beginning to be thinking about what does my secure boot process work like? Um, what features does it does that give me? What do I require for that? Don't leave that to the end. So test that early and test that often. In the case of Zephyr, this is most often an open source bootloader called MCU boot. It's not always the case, but it's a good place to start and it's well supported and, and there's very good documentation around it. Um, and that, will, that gives you a fairly solid foundation. Something to keep in mind with the secure boot 
process though, um, which, which may or may not make you feel comfortable, is that generally secure means immutable, particularly for the bootloader. So again, this is why it's important to get this on the table and plan for this from a very early days because that bootloader as your root of trust is generally something that you do not and cannot be changing in the field. It's important to get it right. You've got your verification keys, public keys burnt into that bootloader probably to verify the rest of the chain of trust. So get this right because it's, it's extremely difficult to change that bootloader in the field if you're, you're taking security seriously, which hopefully you are. <laughs> Um, that secure bootloader should only run valid signed and ideally versioned images. And again, that's part of the immutable process because that signature verification, the, the, the metadata for that exists inside generally the secure bootloader. Um, and I say ideally versioned as well because one of the things you need to take into consideration is that if, and, and your firmware probably will have a life cycle and, and you're, you're, you're putting out incremental releases, adding new features, but also hopefully introducing security fixes. And you generally want to certainly consider the idea of, of enabling rollback protection, which means that let's say firmware 1.0.3 has a known security vulnerability, so I put out 1.0.4 and we ship that. I want to make sure that people with malicious intent cannot intentionally roll back to a version with a, with a, with a known vulnerability to take advantage of that. Um, so that's why not just signing, but versioning is, is also important to plan into your development cycle from the very beginning. So in the case of MCU boot, the, the K-Config flag you want to look at is, is MCU downgrade protection. And there's a very ver variety of ways to implement that um, in hardware and software uh, using a hardware counter. There's, there's a lot of knobs to turn there, but something you, you, you want to think about and, and keep into your, in mind during your, your planning stages. Image content and signature with whatever your secure, secure bootloader is needs to be verified every single reset. It, it, that comes with a cost. It's going to slow down your boot time a little bit, but it's essential to know that every time I boot up my device, the firmware image has not been tampered with, that the signature is still valid. Um, so again, security often, there, there's, a, there's a price to pay for that. In the case of secure boot, that will add some overhead to your, to your startup time. It's nothing ridiculous, but there is a cost to it. Generally, it's worth it. Um, something you probably want to look for uh, that MCU boot does support, but if you're not looking for MCU boot, uh, using MCU boot, is, is you probably want to look for something that also supports image encryption. Um, you, can't, the, the, you, you can't really prevent, people are probably always going to find a way to get your binary image off a chip if they're really determined. But uh, a bootloader that at least out of the box supports image encryption at least raises the bar a little bit if you're publishing firmware update images just on an open TCP server or, or HTTP, et cetera. So just a, de a detail you might want to look for as a criteria is that you can encrypt image as it's in transit from whatever your, your cloud infrastructure is to your, to your IoT device. Um, and MCU boot does have support for this uh, out of the box. Um, Again, because that secure bootloader is immutable, you're probably going to want to look at what are the hardware recovery options for that because you can't change the bootloader, but what happens if you flash a faulty image um, because generally you're going to be locking down your device in other ways. Um, and and this, this is a bit of a trade-off whether you, 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 you want this or don't want this, but it's a good feature to at least a tool to have in your toolbox. So in the case of MCU boot, how that works is you can optionally enable a serial recovery mode that only relies on the bootloader image itself. You can set a specific GPIO pin and then use the standard MCU boot tooling to uh, flash a, a new valid application image in the field. And the, the signature, et cetera, will still be verified on that image. The reason that's nice that that's encapsulated purely inside the bootloader is that MCU boot generally has a requirement also on a valid application image. So if I'm using, say, BLE um, as my transport mechanism to send firmware over MCU boot, I, that BLE stack actually exists in the, in the application image. So if you get a device that's totally bricked and you, something happens with that application image that it's corrupted, it is nice in the field to have a potential path over serial to update your firmware image relying only on that 32 kilobyte bootloader. Again, there's, there's, there's pros and cons to that, but it's a nice feature to at least, a nice tool to have in your toolbox. Um, and tooling is, is, is going to be a very important uh, re requirement when you're looking at secure boot as, as a problem. We'll go into that in, in a couple slides though. So just to sum up, uh, secure boot, it, you, you absolutely want to get this right. You want to do your homework and your due diligence and, and plan from this early on. 
but there are some requirements beyond just picking a secure bootloader. Uh, for example, secure boot absolutely requires that you are protecting the bootloader flash region from overwrites, that nobody else can come in and maliciously replace your bootloader. And that's something that we can't really do at an MCU boot level, level because that, that's going to vary significantly from one SOC to another. Nordic is going to have certain uh, options in place to protect flash memory. NXP, ST are going to have different options. So you really need to be doing your homework to understand how do I lock down that 32, 64, whatever kilobytes of memory so that it can't be rewritten once the device is deployed and, and that's just digging into the data sheet. But again, be aware of it. If you are not, if, 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 if I can easily overwrite my bootloader, I no longer have any semblance of security on my device. Um, if I can just place a malicious chunk of code in there easily. That also means um, disabling generally some SOC device recovery options. So for example, if, if you've used NXP parts, some of the LPC family, it's a, it's a fairly uh, popular set of mass market uh, um, MCUs. There's something called ISP recovery mode where I can set a pin at a specific state when I re reboot the device and hardware and it overrides any sort of uh, user firmware and gives me access to the debug interface, etc. So it's great as a developer because wh whatever I do to my device, I can always recover it and hook my JTAG or whatever, my, my JLink up and, uh, and reflash firmware. You absolutely don't want to be exposing that kind of possibility to someone with malicious intent. Um, so you want to look, be looking again at the data sheets. How do I lock down that feature? It's usually just setting some fuse on the chip, but making sure that you've, you've defined a process to lock down those hardware recovery options that you may or may not be aware of, but you, you want to be digging around to, to lock those down. Similarly, the debug interface. You're going to want to lock down the debug interface, or I can just hook up my JLink and be pulling data off uh, getting the hardware unit key or whatever from a register. So plan early on. For, for, for the, the sort of details of uh, the risks uh, to, to, to make sure that you have a reliable uh, boot process. Um, again, I, we can't go into too much detail. I'm just trying to give some high level pointers. These are the things, the most obvious areas to go wrong. And, and if you want to make a checklist, do this, this, and this um, to, and when you're evaluating your, your boot process. And, and again, to, re to reiterate, this is the one thing you absolutely want to get right. Um, so in terms of tooling, this is MCU boot specific, but MCU boot actually comes with some really good tooling out of the box. So a bootloader is one thing, but the ecosystem around it is also important. It's like a scheduler is, is kind of boring. Zephyr is a great system because it's an ecosystem. It's a bit similar. Your bootloader, you also want good tooling around that. And there are some, some, some pretty good tools out of the box. Um, and there's some community efforts also to, to, to add more tooling. So in the case of MCU boot, you're, you're today, um, the, there's a command line tool called MCU Manager. I know there's, there's some desire to Im introduce better tooling here. I think Nordic specifically, you guys were interested in replacing MCU Manager with something a bit more flexible. It, out of the, it's still not a bad tool out of the box. Um, so it's, it's a CLI uh, command line management tool. Um, and it works over a variety of transports. If yours isn't on this list, you can extend it. Um, so it works out of the box with serial, BLE, and UDP, meaning I can use my mobile phone to interact with my bootloader, send a firmware update, collect some data, et cetera, or UDP, or something else. It is extensible, and there's an extensible command set. It's not just restricted to firmware images. So I can set the date time on the device. If there's an RTC, I can update the file system. I can get thread statistics. Um, stack usage, et cetera, and also device statistics. So if I have an I squared C sensor from the command line, I can see how many times was the I squared C bus pulled, how many errors occurred in the sensor driver. That's extremely useful for debugging things in the field. So it's the, the, the MCU boot brings not just secure boot to the table, it actually brings you a lot of very useful field debugging analytics information. And I find the statistics system in Zephyr, it's something, it's not a subsystem people are aware of, but it's extremely useful for field debugging things that are very difficult for a customer to give you insight to, like how many bus faults have there been on, on the spy bus or whatever. Uh, and you can get that using MCU Manager from the command line tool. You can reset the device. You can send shell commands. Kind of scary. You might not want to enable that, but it's there for development. You can, you, from the, my, my bash prompt, I can be sending uh, shell commands and, and get the response back. Super useful. More, more on the development side, though. Please don't enable that in your, in your deployed devices. Um, the optional, again, th those optional commands are a double-edged sword. So you, you want to be careful with that and you want to evaluate them. Some of them are good, some of them are bad and can be maliciously used. So evaluate that, but it's there. It's extensible and you can do some really interesting stuff out of the box.
Um, I, I think actually the tool that doesn't get a lot of love because it's written in Go. I like Golang. I don't know what's wrong with all you Python people. Golang's a great language. <laughs> Compiles to a binary. So I think the desire is to move to Python, but I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, opinions. <laughs> Uh, image tool is the other tool that you're, 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 you're going to bump into with MCU boot. And this is, you, you might not need to use this directly. This is the tool that's used to sign your firmware image images most of the time. But you can also use it to generate correctly formatted keys for the signing. And, and that's problematic. When you're, when you're trying to generate your own private keys, there's a lot of knobs to turn and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. wrong. So rather than just using like Open, uh, open SSL or something like that. It's nice to have a tool that just gives you a correctly formatted signing key. Um, so you can, you can do that out of the box with the image tool. It'll sign your images. You can also use it to verify firmware images, comparing it with the key to make sure this image is correctly signed, and get very C-friendly uh, public, pu public and private key snippets um, out of it. So it's, it's a useful helper. You generally probably won't interact with it directly, but it, it's there if you need to do something uh, on your own. Um, always, always, please, for the love of all that is good in this world, generate your own private keys from day one. Do not use default keys ever because someone will forget about them, even in development. Generate your own signing key as soon as you start a new project and don't ever ship default keys. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it takes you five minutes and, and just get in the habit of doing it. So in the case of Zephyr and MCU boot, the config, kconfig flag you're going you're gonna to want is this boot signature key file. That will point to a PEM file, and then it will use that during the automatic signing process when you, when you build your firmware images. Just get in the habit of, of, of generating your own keys. So provisioning, um, that's one of those other pillars on the going from secure boot all the way to the other side on provisioning, but it's something that happens very early in the device life, life cycle. So you can see that one over here. Um, and whether that happens purely in the factory or the field is, uh, depends on your use case. The problem is there is no one size fit all approach here. Provisioning is a hard problem. It's a domain specific problem. It's a company specific problem. It's really hard to prescribe what provisioning should, could, might, uh, must look like for you. Uh, there's just so many variables. Can I use a public cloud provider? Is my company okay with pushing my data out to Google, AWS, Amazon, whoever? Does that data need to remain in the EU for legislative re reasons? Where, where can I store that data? Um, does everything need to exist purely behind my company firewall on our own servers? Um, what kind and how many keys and certificates are required on my device? How often will those, those certificates change to use for connecting to TLS servers, et cetera? What does the life cycle look, look like for that? Can those be provisioned purely in the factory once? Do they need to be regularly updated with three, nine, 12 month uh, lifespans? Um, there's, 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 just, there's a lot of knobs to turn there. What level of access control to the provisioning server is, is, is required? Can that exist publicly? Can it just be some um, a Amazon AWS or, or some AWS server that anybody can talk to in the open? Does that need to exist behind layers of security so that things can only be provisioned by key people with access cards in, in, on a factory floor? Uh, only you know that, so who can provision the devices when, where, et cetera? The, it, the, it, it's a complicated landscape, and you're the only one who can really navigate what your requirements are there. But you want to, again, be thinking about that very early on because you don't want to be, have to be integrating key management infrastructure laid in the game into your firmware. You, these are the kind of things you really want to get on the table from day one. So there are two common scenarios for uh, provisioning devices. Um, factory provisioning, and this is generally the easier, the, the easier of the two. This is where devices are, are entirely provisioned in the factory during the hardware manufacture or maybe just before they go into packaging. You're burning your, your unique, some unique ID and some, some key access certificates to talk to your server and, and whatever that metadata uh, might be to communicate with your, your data endpoints. That all happens in the factory. The user opens up the device and it just works. That's the easier solution. The other uh, common scenario is something generally referred to as late binding. In this case, devices are provisioned in the field by the customers, um, generally using an intermediary tool. So this is where I get my wireless security camera or something, I plug it on the wall, then I need to go through the application and I'm going to provision that device into a local network or some sort of cloud network. But that happens once the customer has the device in, in, in their hands. Late binding is, is, is definitely probably the more common scenario in shipping products. It, it, it's the harder one, but that's generally the one you're, 
you're going to probably end up dealing in most uh, um, non-industrial scenarios, I guess. So again, provisioning is it's just a hard problem. Um, this is just kind of a signpost. If, if you're looking for some help and you're new to this provisioning space, here's at least one open standard you can look at, FIDO device on board. It's relatively new. The adoption, I don't think, hasn't been spectacular, but still it's a good standard to at least look at and see what can we learn from this. Maybe, maybe this works for you out of the box, maybe it doesn't, but it'll at least give you some direction. These are the kinds of infrastructure problems you're gonna have. This, this, this is, these are the, the, the issues you need to be looking at. Um, and, and so that's, there, there, aren't, there, there aren't that many open standards out there. So just to sort of lay down a signpost, if, if this is a problem space that interests you, have a look at this. It, it, it's, it, it, it's a good place to start. There are simpler solutions. This one's a bit complex in terms of infrastructure. There's a simpler solution we'll talk about a bit later um, uh, with, with a, a sample at the end. So there's, there's a lot of ways to do this. One of the, just in terms of best practices, one of the, one of the key parts of provisioning though is, is key management. And usually one key is not enough. Generally you're gonna, maybe I, I'll have a key for my TLS server and something for a cloud server and a key for encryption and a key maybe used for signing my sensitive data to ensure that the data traveling through my device to the cloud isn't tampered with. So that needs to be signed and to verify that signature, I need the public key on the, the, the cloud endpoint to verify that my data the, the, the data integrity and, and the provenance of the data. So that, that, that generally involves something called key derivation. Um, and, and again, multiple keys are often required on real world systems. The thing is, key storage is a hard problem. Uh, and the safe, so the safest way to store, to, to store a key is just never to store it, if, if you can get away with that. Um, and so you can use something like a, a, a common standard key derivation function, like HKDF in this case, to, to, do some, to generate something called a device-bound key, which you derive from the, or the hardware unique key. Most MCUs today have a feature in them that they will ship with a, hardware, with a hardware unique key or a unique identifier of some sort. Maybe it's just 16 bytes, but it's something that generally there's, there's a unique number you can get out of a register that uniquely identifies that specific MCU. So it, when, you, when you use something like HKDF to derive a key based on that huck, you get a very interesting feature called a, a, a device bound key. What that means is that that, that that key is tied to a very specific instance uh, of an MCU. And I'll go into a bit of details, but that gives you some interesting features. And there's also the benefit that because I'm deriving that as soon as the device comes out of reset, I never have to store that key anywhere. That solves a huge attack surface. Somebody can get access and dump the binary for my firmware and they're not gonna find that private key. I don't, not having to store it solves a, an entire class of problems for you. Um, it, it, the, the huck then becomes the sensitive thing to protect. But, um, so what, what happens in this process is if I'm using the, 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 the huck plus some sort of info label, so we take the huck plus a string and those two together combine to give me a repeatable output um, that I can regenerate every time it boots. So what we do is every time the device boots, we regenerate these, these private keys. Um, and those keys then are also another advantage is that they're persistent across firmware. I can unflash entirely, an entirely different firmware image. I don't have to worry about wiping out the user's private keys that were used to encrypt things because they were never stored. And it's, it's, it's based on hardware, not a software implementation. As long as you're using something standard like HKDF, the same inputs will always give you the same outputs. Um, so it, it gives you key persistence uh, as, as a potential benefit. It also ties encryption, authentication, et cetera, to a specific MCU. You can imagine a PCB where I have a large external QSPI flash or an SPI device where I need to store device secrets. I want to encrypt that as it goes off my chip to that device. But what happens if somebody um, gets access to that board and maybe they pull the MCU off and they put another MCU on there with a malicious firmware, if I'm using uh, a device bound key for the encryption, replacing that with another malicious M, uh, MCU will not give them access to things that were encrypted because the key that they, that's used for that encryption is tied to that specific physical instance of an MCU. Um, that may or may not be useful to you, but there are a lot of benefits of also, uh, of not just of not storing the key, but having it bound to a very specific instance of a piece of hardware. It makes, I, it makes it much harder for me to pretend to be a device that I'm not because I, without that huck, I can't generate the same signing encryption, whatever authentication keys. So this approach absolutely requires one thing though, that you do need to know how to protect that hardware unique key. And that's again, one of those things that's gonna vary vendor to vendor. So this is a great approach with the caveat, 
figure out how do we lock down access to the hook, that that, that, that hook never leaves the key. So for example, if, if I'm in a situation, if I'm using something like trusted firmware M on the secure side and Zephyr on the non-secure side, that's a common topology where you have distinct secure and secure firmware. Something you need to take into account here is if I have that kind of layout on the secure side, and maybe I, do cure, I can do key, key derivation um, with the same approach on both sides, you make sure on the secure side that you are always appending something extra into that info label on the secure side. And the reason for that is, let's say my non-secure side is telling the secure side of my firmware, I need a new key and use the hook and use this string. And maybe I know that info label, which is the additional differentiating, differentiating the information that gives me a unique key out. If I know that string that the secure side is saying, I can just give it the same string and then I will get the, the, the secure key from my, the, the, uh, I will get the, the private key from the secure side. I can derive that on non-secure. So the, use, taking the simple step of your, your secure key, or key derivation function for keys that exist on the secure, secure side, always ensure that you, you, you accept maybe that extra info label, but it's prepended with something else that only the secure side can prepend. And obviously do some simple checks. So like if the, the non-secure side tries to be a little bit smart and also knows the prepended value and, and appends something else that you, you reject that, that key request. But you, you, you do need to make sure that you are not leaking keys from the secure side to the non-secure side. And the way to do that is to make sure that you are always on the secure side during key derivation, appending extra information into that info field. You don't need to do that on the non-secure side. Um, just as, as, as something you might, may or may not be aware of as, as a pitfall to, to avoid. It's low-hanging fruit, but deal with it from early on. Another benefit of, of this kind of huck based key derivation is you can actually, you don't have to generate private keys. You can actually use this to drive a unique device UUID. If a UUID is a useful identifier for your tens, hundreds, thousands, whatever of devices in the field, this also gives you a device-bound unique UUID, and you can generate multiple versions of those if you want. So there's some other free features of, of this. So if you're not familiar with key derivation, have a look at HKDF. It, 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 it's sort of a well-supported modern standard. The standard's not that inaccessible. Links are, you've got the RFC here. Um, sorry, just a quick time check. <laughs> so securing data in transit. Uh, and this is where you've got your, your firmware image talking to some sort of cloud infrastructure, public, private, whatever, maybe behind a company firewall, but there's still some kind of communication going on there. Uh, the too long didn't read is just use TLS. If, if you can establish a TL, if you can establish a connection with a server, just use TLS. You want to talk to MQT, your MQTT broker, just use TLS. It's, it, 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 it's tried, it's true, it's universally adopted, it's reliable, it's based on modern encryption standards, they keep it up to date, just use TLS, problem solved. If you can, if, if you can connect to something, do everything you have to, to, to use TLS for that. And the only maybe caveat here is make sure, uh, in, in Zephyr for example, when you're establishing that connection, make sure you're enforcing a recent version of TLS, which is TLS 1.2 is sort of a good minimum starting point today. So don't accept TLS 1.1, et cetera, connections. Just you'll avoid a certain class of problems that way. So just, again, best practices. If this is new to you, you, you haven't played around with TLS on an embedded device, here's a good example to look at, the HTTP GET socket sample. You can see how to get the, the, the certificate authority on the Zephyr device, um, which will enable you to verify that you're actually talking to a server that you should be talking to and it's not pretending to be someone else. So there's just a good pointer if you're interested uh, and, and new to uh, communicating over TLS with a server. Have a look at that one, it's a good starting point. So basic TLS authentication um, validates the server identity. In a sense, it gives me as a client device a degree of confidence in who I'm talking to because that server has a certificate that is signed by a certificate authority and I trust that certificate authority that they're doing their homework to actually validate that this server is who he says he is. Um, so the way that that generally works is you got your client device with your Zephyr firmware here and it's tr it wants to talk to a server. So it will send a client hello message, just a part, of the start of the, part of the standard TLS handshake. Uh, and the server will respond, hey, how's it going? sends a server hello over, and part of that server hello includes the server's X509 certificate, which is signed by a CA. I get that certificate on the client side. I have the CA's public key. 
And I can say, you know, okay, you know, you, you look like who you say you are, but I, I want to check anyway. So it can check the signature on that certificate. And if it, if it matches the, the, the CA I have, I have a reasonable degree of confidence that I'm, that I'm talking to someone that I can, I, I can share information with. And the TLS handshake goes on with a key derivation process and you eventually end up with symmetric encryption of data using AES or something else and, and depending on the, what, what the server supports. It's a fairly well understood process. It brings up an interesting question though. How does the server know that it's talking to a trusted client device? So I, 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 the server, you know, he's, he's, he's flashing his credentials, but how does that server know who I am? Am I pretending to be someone else? That's, that's an interesting problem that maybe you don't think about as much with TLS. And TLS out of the box actually includes something called client authentication. And this is where the server also asks the client device to prove its, its identity. And, and what's, what's important here is that we're not inventing anything. This is a standard part of TLS. Every TLS stack out there is going to support this. So you don't have to invent some weird process to prove who you are. You can, you can use this with any HTTP server, whatever the TCP server that you're talking to. Um, so there, there are some, if you're using a cloud provider to push out your data to MQTT or whatever, some of the cloud providers have better or worse support for this client authentication. Um, Azure, I, I, I don't want to play favorites, but for example, I think Azure IoT Hub, this is something they've done well and maybe a bit better than some of their competition is they have very good support out of the box for you upload your, you upload your CA certificate to Azure IoT Hub and it can use that to validate any incoming client requests to know that they have a certificate that's been signed by that CA and, and then they accept or reject the connection. So you can do this on your own as well, but there, there are... Um, the support for this, the, the use of this extra feature isn't a given, but some, some cloud providers are, are making more progress in there. Something to look at though, uh, to, to, to establish trust in both directions. So how that works in, in practice uh, is um, you start with the same process. I've got my client device talking to my server. Hey, how is it going? The server says, hey, haven't seen you in a while. Here's my certificate again, just in case proof who I am. But part of that server hello also includes now an extra step where the server says, hey, you know what? Um, I haven't seen you in a while. I just want to make sure everything's above board. So why don't you send me back your certificate as well? And you can see that here in the bottom, this client certificate request. And that's going to prompt the client device to take its X509 certificate, which was signed by, our, uh, by a specific CA via the certificate signing request. It's going to send that certificate over to the server device and then the server device can, it can just verify the signature and make sure it's signed by a CA that I trust and maybe that's enough. Maybe it actually wants to talk to that, that, that CA infrastructure and say, okay, you're signed, but has this device been block listed? Is, is this certificate still valid? Is it, um, so that, that you, can, you can take more or less steps on the server side then to verify that device. Maybe this device has a UUID that I know the device has been stolen or compromised. I can then reject that connection based on that, that extra data. So that out of the box using entirely open standards that are well supported and everything, you can add um, device authentication to, to, to your, your Zephyr device. So this is where you, you, you can introduce like basic client authentication because inside that X509 device certificate, you don't just need a, a key and a, a, a public key. Oh, already five minutes. Okay, quicker. <laughs> you, can, you can stick fun data in, in, in there. Um, so if, you, if, if you're interested in, in some examples, here's one, you, you click this link or look at this QR code. Here's an example of generating a mutual TLS TCP server. It's in Go, I'm sorry for the Python people. Um, and there's a, script, a bash script in there for generating certificates for the server and the public keys, et cetera, just to give you some pointers. If you wanna go in details, here's a, here's a talk from last year's ZDS, specifically on X509 client authentication. So securing data at rest. What do we do when TLS isn't available? And some use cases are like, I need to place secure information into external flash. I need to use an intermediary app to send data to the cloud. So maybe I use BLE to talk to my phone. My phone relays it to a cloud server. How do we deal with those situations? Um, securing data at rest is unfortunately less of a solved problem today. There, there's, there's, there's a lot more work needed here and it's not as easy as TLS. Just use TLS, solves your problems. For data at rest, we don't have that option. To my knowledge, COSE, is the only open embedded appropriate standard I'm personally aware of for protecting data at, at rest. And COSE is something that's built on top of CBOR, a concise binary object something. 
um, which is, it's basically, it's binary JSON. It's very tightly t coupled to JSON. And it's, not, it's a nice standard because you can, you can very richly express complex data and relationships between nested data. So COSE is something that builds on top of Zebra. It allows you for signing and encryption of data at rest using modern mm -hmm. ciphers. And I really believe this is something that should be actively promoted as a solution for securing data at rest. Unfortunately, COSE encryption, the E in the COSE, is less common than the signing part today, the S. So there's very poor encrypt and encrypt zero library support today, particularly in C. So there are some C libraries like TCOSE that are making an effort to improve this, but it's still an active work in progress. And there's no profiles in COSE, so you kind of need to know a little bit what you're doing to glue things together. If you're interested in this, we put together a Rust proof of, proof of concept. Um, for what COSE uh, looks like encrypting data uh, at rest. So you can follow that first link to see some examples of this is what COSE encryption might, should, could look like for an embedded device with efficient throughput. There's also, there was a talk a couple months ago from my colleague in the back, David Brown, discussing what does efficient COSE encryption look like. Watch that talk if you're interested in this problem. I think it's a good standard that you should keep your eyes on. In terms of example, um, everybody loves examples. You want to see an example of what end-to-end -end boot to cloud security looks like, how this all glues together. A good example we've done in Lenaro is something called confidential AI. What is that very quickly? It's an attempt to demonstrate end-to-end -end security best practices based on modern Cortex M, hard M hardware, B8M, ARM Trust Zone, using entirely open source standards and open source software with AI ML uh, workloads as a case. So we're doing inference on the secure side and demonstrating how do I secure the data pipeline from from the secure to the non-secure to the cloud, signing, encrypting data, et cetera. Nothing special about the AI, it's just a use case because I think having a good use case leads to better engineering results. So we picked AI, AI ML as the use case. How do I secure my models and my data? This is what it looks like. Um, here's the links. If you want more details, there's a sample bootstrap server in there. If you don't want to use some complex provisioning thing, here's a good starting point for what provisioning might look like. We put together a bootstrap server to take in device UUIDs, um, generate certificate signing, parse certificate signing requests, register those certificates in a database. Uh, and then the, the, the top link here is the, the, the parent repository for confidential AI, which is based on Zephyr and trusted firmware M. You can run it in QEMU, no hardware required, totally emulation friendly, including the cloud connectivity over TLS. Um, quickly, checklist, integrate your bootloader early on, understand your provisioning requirements, Replace your default keys, please, on day one, even during dev. Plan for key storage. Just use TLS 1.2. Um, don't use if, if, if you're using TLS, think about it for client auth. Data at rest is still a work in progress, but COSE is the standard to watch. Please get involved. Thank you. I'm sorry. That was like 39 minutes. No questions, I guess. But <laughs> If, if you've got any questions, just, just chase me down over here. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. Uh, so sorry, I don't have time for questions. So hope that was useful anyway.